Can you guys hear me now? Let's try that again. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says these words. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Follow my example, basically, as I follow that of Christ. Look like me as I look like Jesus. <laughs> I want that. Like, I want that for my family. I want to I have that. I want to be able to have my kids look back and say, I want to be like that. But I see the warts. Right? I see the wounds. I see the decisions. I see uh, the, the times I've lost my temper. I, I see these things, and I have a... I don't know how Paul could say that. Right? Do you, do you find yourself wondering, how could you possibly tell somebody, hey, you want to know what Jesus looks like? Just follow me. But that's what I want. And Paul says that by the Holy Spirit, because it's something that's possible. And if we're honest, if you're a follower of Jesus, you want to be able to be that. Be that mom, to be that dad, to be that husband, to be that coworker, to be that friend, to be that son, to be that daughter. You want to be able to be that person when other people look at you, they say, wow, there is something different. But man, I'll tell you what, if you're like me, it feels like there is a chasm. Like there is this, this thing, and then there's this you, and then how do we get this to be this? And that's a tough thing. And today, as we finish out our series, Christmas Isn't Canceled, as we finish out looking at how God has called us to live, how Jesus is, what I want to do this morning is just look at Jesus. I want to look at one story from the life of Jesus that is, there aren't any miracles in this story. There aren't any things in this story that are, are not possible. And, and the reason I want to do this is because as we look at Christmas, uh, we have this picture of the baby Jesus, right? We have this, this picture of the little boy Jesus, no crying he makes as you lay him away in a manger, right? And, and this baby is just, his face is glowing and it's, it's beautiful and we, because he's God, right? How many of you had babies? If you would have just laid that little baby in a, in a feed trough with hay, they just wouldn't have cried and they would have smiled at you and cooed. Anybody? No, because babies cry, right? So this picture of Jesus is like, this, this little saintly thing that's walking around 100% God, he is 100% God, but he's also 100% man. Jesus was 100% man. He is 100% man. He experienced every temptation that we experience. In fact, if you read uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, it says this, or, or we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted in, as we are, yet is without sin. So Jesus was tempted in all the same ways that you are, in the same ways that I am. If you think about the ways that you have been tempted, there are things that you have been tempted by that you don't want anybody to ever know about. And yet Jesus was without sin. So he knows your experience. He knows what it is that, that you've experienced because he lived this. And so what I want to do this morning I want to talk about Jesus, and I want to talk about who it is that we're following, and who it is that is ultimately our example, who it is that Paul says, follow my example as I'm following him, so that someday, even maybe without knowing it, people will be watching you and seeing Jesus. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Luke chapter 2. Uh, starting in verse 41. So if you guys want to turn there, we're going to be uh, looking at this story this morning here in Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Now, uh, just to set the scene here, um, we have a lot of information about Jesus. Uh, not, I mean, a, a, a lot of information about Jesus from his first, like, eight days, from his first few months. Up until two years old, we have some. We know that Jesus, uh, you know, the, the angels proclaimed his birth. The angel, uh, an angel told Mary that, he was going, that she was going to be great with child, and then she was pregnant you know, by, by the power of God. And an angel told Joseph to not leave Mary even though she was pregnant, and it wasn't his baby. We know that, that, that this baby was born in Bethlehem in, in what would be kind of like a stable, 
Um, we know that after he was born, uh, some wise men showed up, and then they left, and, and, and an angel appeared to Mary and Joseph, said, you guys need to move to Egypt because the Herod wants to kill you. And then we know that, that Mary and Joseph, an angel again told them, hey, you can go back now, and they moved to Nazareth. That's about all that we know about Jesus until he's 30 years old, except for this one story. And it's going to be starting in, in Luke chapter 2, uh, verse 41 through 43. So let's dig into this, guys. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem and his parents didn't know it. So Mary and Joseph got up every year and they went to Jerusalem as good Jewish people do. Uh, for a couple different festivals. They went for the Passover, right? And, and then they went for Yom Kippur, which is the, the, the day of atonement to, uh, to sacrifice for the sins that they had committed during the year. So this is uh, what good Jewish people do. But I want to ask ourselves, because these are the people that Jesus was placed with by God. I want to look at what they did as Jesus is growing up, who it is that, that he was growing up with. Because again, he is 100% man, a boy, just like I was a boy at one time and half of the crowd was. Um, so Mary and Joseph, place yourself in their shoes for a moment. So they lived in Israel, which was a country that was underneath the thumb of the Roman people, right? The, Rome, uh, the, the Roman army occupied Israel. Uh, there, there was an arm, a garrison in Jerusalem. There was a garrison around Nazareth. There were always uh, uh, military people around. If you acted up or if you started to rebel, the, the military would move in, and, and that would be the end of it. If you know anything about the Roman army, uh, there's a decent chance that after Rome finally fell, there was not another army as strong as them for the next thousand years. So the, the Roman army was something you just couldn't mess with right? And these are the people that were there. Now, imagine you lived in a country. We don't. We live in America where we can do what we want. Imagine a country came in and conquered America, and there was a garrison of, well, I've used this illustration before. Let's say Canadians attacked, attacked America, because Canadians, they're always looking, right? Imagine that there was a Canadian garrison of military soldiers in Moriarty. How many of us would sooner or later think, we got we to figure out a way to get rid of these Canadians, right? We would hate it. And in honesty, we find ourselves questioning God for allowing this to happen. The people of Israel constantly were praying for God to get rid of the Romans. This is the God that they served that allowed this to happen to them. But beyond that, specifically for Mary and Joseph, Mary was, well, she was made pregnant by God. But nobody else believed that. In fact, if you read, really, if you, if you read the story in Luke 1, it reads out like Mary went and stayed with her cousin Elizabeth so that she could avoid the shame of being pregnant, not by her husband. In the culture that you would live in there, this would be something that would be embarrassing, and God did this to her. And then they end up in Jerusalem, because, or in Bethlehem, because, well, God sent them there, and Joseph stayed with her. But after the birth of Jesus in a feed trough, they flee to Egypt because the king wants to kill them. And then after they get established in Egypt, they have to move back to Nazareth, which is hundreds of miles away, with a young child. This is what God did to them. How many of us have been mad at God for things a lot less than having people want to kill us and running us all over the world? Anybody? How many of us have struggled to even want to go to worship, to go to church, because of the fact that God had allowed some terrible things to happen to us? I've been there. I'm the preacher, but there have been Sundays when I didn't want to get up to share the truth because I'm like, I don't battle with where I'm at right now. And yet God, and yet God was not done. What I, I bring all that up because Mary and Joseph, 
even with all that they had experienced, even with the the hard things that they experienced, every year made two different 100-mile pilgrimages into Jerusalem from Nazareth. They would go and they would load up Jesus and ultimately Jesus' younger siblings, and they would go into Jerusalem with the family, and they would go and they would make sacrifices, and they would go and they would worship every year. Jesus had a family that was an example to him, an example to him of not quitting when things got tough. I want to be that. I haven't always been that. When I was a kid, we would play Monopoly with my family, me and my brothers would, and I was the oldest, just to set the scene here. I was the oldest, and I'd play Monopoly, and there would come a point when you're playing Monopoly, you know, when there's hotels down every strip, and none of them are your hotels. And, and you see your car, and then you roll a six, and you realize, I'm landing on one of those hotels, and this is the end, I'm, I'm done with this. You know that feeling? When that would happen to me, I would then say, earthquake, shake the board, run off, and say, Loser has to clean up, and that, that would be the end of it. This is how I saw life when things didn't go my way. For Mary and Joseph, the people raising Jesus, they still focused their lives on worshiping the God that had not given them everything that they would have hoped for because they realized that there was no other place to find hope. There was nothing else that could give them hope and deliverance from the place that they were at. This is important to us because instead of focusing on what was unfair in their lives, Mary and Joseph worshiped God. And regardless of circumstances, this is what we can do. The faithful live in a, on a foundation of the promises God has made. We can live on this foundation of what God has promised us even when things do not go our way. And so Jesus, along with hundreds or thousands of other people, went on a pilgrimage every year into Jerusalem to remember what God had done. And then his parents went back, and he didn't. So let's look at verse 44 through 46. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among the relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. So here's what happened. Mary and Joseph uh, get up, and and, well, Jesus is 12, so he's in that that crossover point between being a a child and being a man. This is the place of a bar mitzvah in the Jewish culture, and and so uh, this is that age, and so Jesus, um, they're, they're traveling, and they get up to leave. Now, you would have traveled by hundreds of people because traveling together is better than traveling alone. And hundreds of people, maybe thousands, would have traveled back to Nazareth and they're traveling with their group. And so they set off to leave and you can imagine they go and they get to dinner time and they finally get there and, and, and they figure Jesus was traveling with his cousins or hanging out with his friends or with these other people. And so you sit down for dinner and you start calling for Jesus. And then Jesus doesn't show up. So you go and you find Jesus' cousin. You say, hey, have you seen Jesus today? No, I didn't, I didn't see him. He, he was probably with uh, Judah over there. And then you go talk to Judah, and Judah didn't see him. Any of you guys ever lost a kid? The feeling has to be that of crazy panic. And so uh, for Mary and Joseph, they, they realize Jesus is not here. By now, you're a day away from Jerusalem. What do you do? Well, you just can't hop on your phone and call. You can't hop in the car and drive back to town. So Mary and Joseph walk back. It's a day out and a day back. And then in the third day, they finally found Jesus. How would you be in that moment? Imagine how you would be. If you're you're Mary, we'll read here in a minute, Mary was deathly afraid. It actually says here in a little bit, Mary says, basically, you freaked us out, Jesus. Why was she scared? Hadn't God promised Mary that Jesus was going to, well, he's the Christ, that he was going to cause the rising and the falling of nations? Well, he hadn't done that. 
So why was she scared? I mean, God was going to take care of it, so why was she scared? Because even for these people, and I want this to understand, I want to be able to see this, even for these people who had had angels speak to them the promises of God, they still found themselves afraid when things didn't go the way they expected. Even when things were promised to them, they still found themselves battling fear and doubt. Fear is not of God, but it's a battle that we have, and we have to understand that the only way out of this, again, is to focus on what what it is that God has done. So let's take a look here at how this plays out. Verse 47 through 50. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. So they walk up on Jesus and they find him sitting at, at the, on the stairs, listening to the rabbis, asking questions, giving answers. And, and they say, what are you doing? And Jesus' answer, and I think that this is the most important thing that you're going to hear today. Jesus' answer is, why did you look for me? Did you not know that I had to be about my father's business or in my father's house? That I had to be about what it is that God had built me for or or set me here for. That I had to be about why it is that God sent me. This is the age, 12 years old, when in a Jewish culture, a boy moved away from his parents and became a man. And Jesus was focused on who God had called him to be. He was focused on being obedient to the Father of the universe. Jesus was 100% man. Right? He was like us. Dealing with the same temptations that you deal with, the, 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 temptation, some temp, the same temptations that, that I deal with, dealing with the same battles that we have. But the trajectory of his heart was focused on who it is that God had called him to be. Struggle with this. I really do. So Mary and Joseph, they walk up. Mary says, don't you realize what you have done? You had us in great distress. You had us freaking out here, Jesus. And Jesus' answer to them is, well, so let's just say one of my kids just decided to disappear for two or three days, right? And and then I were to show up and and say, what were you thinking? We're we're freaking out here, which is what I would do um, in nice, soft, kind words, because that's, (laughs) Right? If my kid said to me then, what? Didn't you know that I had to be about my father's business? I would be less than thrilled, right? But what I would be looking for was a deferential voice. I'm sorry, I I didn't mean to, or I'm sorry, this is what I had to do. I probably should have told you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, something like that. Jesus doesn't say that. Is Jesus, well, For the fifth commandment, right? The Ten Commandments. The fifth commandment is what? Honor your father and mother so that it may go well with you, so that you may live long in the land. Is Jesus honoring his father and mother in this moment? Is Jesus breaking the commandment? Because it sure feels like it. But he's not. What Jesus is doing is he is building his life on the greatest commandment and letting everything else flow from there. When Jesus was asked much later on, what is the greatest commandment, he, he repeats the Shema, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 6-4, uh, six, the, to love the... Hear the Lord, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
And then he says, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets are built up in the, built on top of this, that Jesus is in this moment saying what he will say much later on. My entire life is built on knowing God. And from that, my love for everybody else is going to come. So what Jesus did here is not a miracle. We want to picture Jesus as a child, as some kind of miraculous, a little saintly child with a glowing face. In fact, much later on, the writings about Jesus, when, when people tried to imagine what Jesus was like as a child, there are some extra biblical stories, not biblical stories about Jesus, from when he was like seven. Um, there, there's one story that says that Jesus, when he was like seven years old, was taking dirt and he was forming it into birds and going, and the birds were flying away. And there's another story of Jesus when he was seven or eight, and, and he had made pools of water with little dams, and he made little pools of water, and a little boy walked up and kicked the dams down, and the water flowed away. And so Jesus cursed the boy, and he withered up like a tree, and he died. That's not Jesus. Jesus, when he was a child, didn't do anything that you and I couldn't do. Is there anything that stops us from saying, don't you know that I need to be about my father's business? Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Follow my example as I follow Christ. Follow my example as I point my life at the Father. As I build my life on the Father. Jesus' main goal was walking with his Father. He's sitting there, even then, he's sitting there and he's asking questions. He's sitting there and he's, 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 he's brainstorming with the rabbis. He is growing in his Father's business. And he's growing. Now look at the end of the passage here, verse 51 and 52. And he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. So I said earlier that there is nothing in this story that's miraculous, that there's nothing that Jesus did that is, that is miraculous, but that's not entirely true because everything about this story is miraculous. Jesus is 100% man, but he's also 100% God. If you've ever found yourself wondering what would God do in this, this circumstance, what we see in the life of Jesus is how God would live if he were you and me. What we see in the life of Jesus is how the God of the universe would live if he was walking in our stuff, in the temptations that we're dealing with, in the battles that we're dealing with, in the hard times that we're dealing with. Jesus is walking in a country that is underneath oppression. He is walking in a country that was underneath another government. Jesus was walking in a world where people did evil to them and to him. God was walking in the same struggles that you and I walk in. And when he went back home as a boy, he honored his parents and he lived a humble life that others could not help but look at. It says he grew in wisdom and stature and in knowledge of God and men. He grew in a way that other people looked at him and said, there is something different about this kid. Anytime you live by the Holy Spirit and do that, that's a miracle. But here's the cool part. When we allow the Holy Spirit to do that in us, that's a miracle too. Because we're showing the world what God would do if God were here 
when we start to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us, when we start to, to, to love people who are unlovable in the way that God loves us, when we start to forgive. When we start to be an example. So here's my bottom line for you guys today. If we're following Jesus, we will always be focused on the Father's business. And that's really the question that that this all comes down to. The, The thing that makes this a hard sermon the thing that makes this hard to live out, the reason why it's, it's hard for us to imagine being that example is there's always something that is tearing us away, right? To, to tear us away from the Father's business, and it may be work, it may be home, it may be uh, an addiction, but we can know what God would do. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, they, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and his pleasing, his perfect will. When we are not conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but transformed by looking at what God would do, we start to know how God would live. We would start to know God's will. We start to be able to live something that is different. And so... The challenge is going to be, not today. Sunday, it's easy to say, I want to be God's man today, or I want to be a woman built after God today. It's harder on Monday. It's harder at work. It's harder at home when you're trying to get the kids out the door. It's harder when you get the phone call from a parent who's upset. It's harder when you you are, are constantly bombarded with reminders of bad decisions you've made in the past. But what I want to ask you to do is to look at Jesus. To follow the example. And what Jesus did simply is wake up in the morning and say, I have to be about my father's business. First and foremost, this is my job. He was raised to be a carpenter, to be a a craftsman. He was raised to do that thing and he could do that work. But it was built about glorifying his father. It was built around that. And there's a couple things that I think we need to do as a church to be able to make this thing happen, to be able to follow that example. One is to find an example. So, and this is going to take prayer, but what I want to ask you to do is start to pray about somebody that you can look at that's living this out a little further along than you are. The church has not always been good at this. Um, but look at somebody who's living this out a little further and start to model your life after that person. You may go talk to that person and say, hey, can I ask you some questions? Tell me what it means to do this. Find an example, but then the last thing is, is going to be this. Live as an example. You don't know it. And you know, actually, you know this. You know that people are always watching. But there will come a day. If you're living as, as an example now, there will come a day when somebody else is going to look and say, hey, I just want you to know, you have helped me follow God because of the way that you kept your calm in this, because of the way that you didn't lose it, or the way that you continued to pray, or the way that you, as a father, prayed for your family as a husband prayed for your wife, as a wife prayed for your husband, or prayed for us at work. When we do that, we start to show the world the miracle of a changed heart. The miracle of something different. And in that, you get to the place where you can say 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Follow my example as I follow Christ. Because your heart is built on doing the Father's business. Please pray with me. God, I I ask right now that you would please drive out. Drive out the things that keep us from following your example. Drive out the things that seem so urgent, seem so important 
that we can't move any other direction. Lord, I thank you for Jesus, and I thank you for sending Jesus to die for us to make this even possible. Because the sin that we battle is greater than anything we can fight, and yet he died for it. God, please point our hearts to you this week. Remind us of the desire that we have now to live for you. Remind, of, remind us of it on Tuesday and on the days that are hard. God, thank you. I thank you for redeeming us. Help us to live for you. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So we're now going to move into a time of